Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to tonight's edition of Q&A with Dr. Noah Greenspan. Uh, we are ready to go, so uh, let's talk a couple of minutes, not a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds. Usual disclaimers. Um, number one, pulmonary wellness. We own it, don't use it. Very simple, okay? We will find you. Um, number two, medical disclaimer. So everything I talk about essentially is based on my own experience over the past 22 years as a cardiovascular and pulmonary physical therapist and based on my experience here at the Pulmonary Wellness and Rehabilitation Center. It is not a substitute for medical advice. It is not a substitute for the advice of your healthcare team. It is not even a suggestion. I'm sharing information with you, so please make sure that before you do anything that you think I told you you should do, check it with your doctor, nurse, healthcare professional. Don't run out and do it, and don't say no one made me do it. Um, all right, so one thing just before we go on, if you want to ask a question, we're not gonna have any people talking live, okay? Um, but if you want to ask a question, please type it in and a member of our team will get to it. And we are going to start now. It is 6.31, you got 59 minutes of Q&A. Let's do it. Okay, to start, we've got one question from- By the way, this is Nicole, who's gonna be reading the questions. Nicole Spoletic, my assistant in all things creative and some non-creative. Go for it. Thank you. This is a question from June. June asks, why does my nose run and run and run? You get the point. My nose really runs. Most of the time, I am okay while seated, but with any activity, it is like a faucet was turned on. No amount of blowing my nose will stop the flow. Is there anything that can be done to reduce, or better yet, stop the flow? Okay, so <clears throat> the question is, why does my nose run and run and run? So June has a runny nose, or in medical terms, rhinorrhea. That's not a joke. It's really called rhinorrhea, okay? So here's the thing, uh, why does your nose run? I don't know because I don't know you, but let's talk about nose running, okay? There are many, many different things that can cause your nose to run, okay? Essentially, let's talk about the function of the nose for a second. And one thing that you should think about is the fact that when we are teaching you breathing techniques, okay, we are always asking you to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Why do we do that? Okay, I think most of you know that when you blow out through pursed lips, there is a back pressure that goes backwards into your lungs, okay, and helps to keep the airways open during exhalation. But many of you don't know why we ask you to breathe in through your nose. And in fact, a lot of people are always saying to me, not are always, but a lot of people say to me, well, I prefer to breathe in through my mouth, or uh, they bring these different types of breathing methods to me. Breathing in through your nose serves three main purposes, and those purposes are to warm the air, to filter the air, and to humidify the air, okay? So we talk a lot about the fact that your body likes homeostasis. In other words, it likes stability. It likes things to be the same, and that means in terms of the temperature, in terms of it wants to protect you from pathogens and allergens, and it wants to have the same general humidity um, during, you know, at all times. So that's the three purposes of the nose. So the other thing to keep in mind is that mucus is supposed to be a good thing. So mucus is supposed to be protective of you, meaning that if you're standing outside and the school bus goes by and the school bus is the same bus they've been using for the last 20 years and it puts all this soot out into your face, basically mucus is supposed to trap whatever's coming in and prevent it from getting to your lungs. Same thing with bronchoconstriction. So when this happens, okay, or when you're exposed to some type of pathogen, the airways, the smooth muscle inside the airways is supposed to contract in order to protect you, okay? But when we have a lung disease like COPD, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and we'll have a little refresher now. COPD is only chronic bronchitis and emphysema. It's not asthma, okay? Stop saying it. So now again, if you have a disease like COPD or emphysema, we don't want that, that air, that dirty air going in, not that we ever do, but when you have these type of diseases, whether it's cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, even asthma, there's a hypersensitivity and a hyperactivity of these types of systems. So in other words, your airways are hypersensitive, meaning that they are gonna be overly constricted, okay? 
you are um, going to have an increase in mucus production um, that is an overproduction of mucus. So if we just had the normal amount of mucus, because we all produce mucus all day, and if we're producing mucus in very small amounts, what happens is it catches what we want, and it basically, um, you know, essentially, um, you guys need to chill. Um, so what, what happens is the mucus catches what you want and we swallow it mostly during the day, okay? So when it becomes overproduction, that's where it's a problem. That's, and that's what we're talking about with a runny nose. And there's a lot of potential reasons for this. Now this question specifically talks about during activity, okay? So I mentioned that the body likes homeostasis. It likes to keep things the same. Now it's winter time and there's a lot of dry air, okay? And the dry air is irritating and it's also so it sounds funny, but it's also very drying to the airways. And so the airways are constantly having to produce more mucus, okay, and in order to overcome that. Now, why is it with activity that it gets worse, okay? It's possible, and again, all these things are possibilities. They're not definites, but with activity, you're actually getting more air going across the airways, going across the mucous membranes, drying it out more, potentially irritating it more, and that could be doing it. So what could be done about it? I'm not going to give you a specific thing, okay? You have to talk to your doctor about this. You have to talk about the runny nose. Um, if your general practitioner can't do it or your pulmonary doctor can't do it, this is a time when, you know, uh, a visit to the ENT, ear, nose, and throat doctor um, is a very, very good idea. And, you know, the specialties are specialties for a reason. So I know that's not a super specific answer because there is no super specific answer to this question because there can be many causes and therefore there could be different treatments to it. Uh, one thing I might recommend is maybe a nasal rinse, okay, during your shower, uh, morning and night. We pick up a lot of dust during the course of the day and that's known to sort of make us more susceptible to inflammation. And, you know, I personally have found that using a nasal rinse or a saline rinse uh, is very helpful. Some people call it a neti pot um, and, that, and those are my suggestions about that. Other things, make sure your air is filtered well. Make sure that your air is humidified, especially in the winter time, especially if you live someplace where, um, you know, there's really a lot of dry heat. Like in New York City, we you know, I live in an old building where the heat is very, very drying, and that is very irritating to the airways. Um, and that is my answer to that question. Do we have another question? We do. This next question is about oxygen, specifically about supplemental oxygen. Okay. The question is, how can a patient compare the oxygen output from one apparatus to the other? The leader setting may be the same, but the output is not. Specifically, comparing the portable oxygen condenser that is carried to oxygen cylinders and an at-home portable oxygen condenser. Okay, so what we're talking about now is we're talking about different delivery devices for oxygen and their effectiveness. So. This is a question that's going to get me in trouble, I know that, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. When we talk about the different type of devices, the most commonly used devices that people are going to have, uh, let's say in the home, when somebody's prescribed oxygen, they're going to be using what's called an oxygen concentrator. And what an oxygen concentrator does is an oxygen concentrator is going to filter the air and kind of extract the oxygen from it. Um, Sorry about that banging. It seems like every time we start a webinar, the heat in here kicks up. I apologize for that. Hopefully it's gonna go away soon. If not, I'm gonna talk louder. So we have essentially this question is, what is the difference between a tank where you're getting compressed actual 100% oxygen versus a concentrator where you're getting what we call the same liter flow, but it doesn't seem to be as effective. So let's talk about that, okay? And this is a very, very important topic because now one of the hot topics in medicine, particularly pulmonary medicine, is that of the portable oxygen concentrator. So let's start with gas, okay? When you are getting a tank of oxygen, what you're getting there is 100% oxygen, okay? The air is, uh, in, in air, our air is approximately 21% oxygen or 20.96 or 20.97 oxygen to be exact. When you're getting that air out of the tank, that's medical grade 100% oxygen. Now that's a much higher grade than that 
Oxygen in Las Vegas at the Oxygen Bar that's pina colada flavored. That is not medical grade oxygen. That's a little bit of a hoax there, okay? But when you get oxygen out of a green oxygen cylinder or a silver oxygen cylinder, that is supposed to be medical grade 100% oxygen. And when you are turning that liter, when you're turning that regulator, okay, those numbers correspond to liter flow per minute. So one equals one liter per minute, two equals two liters per minute, three equals three liters per minute. I'm sure you can guess what four means, okay? When we talk about the concentrators, okay, and we're talking about the home concentrators that are plugged into the wall, those are also supposed to give you a liter flow. So in other words, the one on the home plug in the wall oxygen concent concentrator is supposed to be one liter of oxygen. The two is supposed to be two liters of oxygen. Now, if you think about what it takes to break up a molecule of oxygen, okay, the simple fact is that when we talk about a tank of oxygen versus a home concentrator, it's not really apples, it's really a little bit of apples and oranges. Although in theory it's supposed to be the same, we never get the same reading from somebody on four liters on a concentrator as if we're getting four liters with the gas. The gas is almost always going to be higher because it's a much purer percent of oxygen, meaning 100% oxygen, okay? The other thing now to talk about is the portable oxygen concentrators, okay? And the thing about the portable oxygen concentrators, and there's a lot of them, and I'm not going to mention any specific names because I don't want to get sued, but there's other reasons for it because it, in a way they're kind of all in the same boat, okay? But I'm going to use, I am looking now at the pulmonary paper, okay, which every year puts out pulmonary paper. I like you guys. Um, every year they put out this list, this guide to the best portable oxygen concentrators. And inside here, okay, what it does is it's showing you all of the different characteristics of the different concentrators. So now some of these, I want to just be clear about this. Now this is also available online. So if you go pulmonary paper, oxygen concentrator review, and you will be able to pull up the same information. And this is a guy named Ryan Deesom who does this, and I've read about him, and I've read about read his stuff, and I think he's a, a I'm very, have a great deal of respect for him. So let's just talk about the columns, okay? The first column says unit name, which speaks for itself, but the next thing says available settings. And here's what, if I go down the list of available settings, we see one to three. 1 to 5, 1 to 5, 1 to 4. Notice that does not say available liters per minute. It says available settings. So the point to keep in mind is that 3 on any given concentrator does not in any way, shape, or form mean that you're getting 3 liters of oxygen per minute. It doesn't, okay? Now here's something else, okay? It tells you the pulse dose type. And the pulse dose type means that it could either be continuous or it could be dosed, okay? It could be pulsed, meaning that it gives you a, a, a bolus of oxygen when you take a breath in and you trigger it. There's, the next thing is the maximum dose per breath, okay? So now let me give you an example, okay? In one of these, okay, the maximum dose per breath is 33 milliliters at 30 breaths per minute. 33 milliliters at 30 breaths per minute. Now, get your calculator out and multiply 30 by 33. And if I'm not mistaken, that comes out to be, Chris, 990, okay? So what does that mean, 990 milliliters? How many milliliters are there in a liter? A thousand, okay? Now I could be wrong, maybe I don't understand this, okay? But if I'm not mistaken and I'm reading this correctly, what that's telling you is that even on the highest setting, the maximum dose you're getting is 990 milliliters per minute, which is less than a liter. So when you ask yourself, I don't understand this, why am I carrying this oxygen concentrator around and even though I'm on five, I'm still desaturating, well that could be part of your answer, okay? And this is something that really has to be worked on um, over time and sometimes you know we say to ourselves like we see patients that come in and their oxygen is so low even at the highest setting on the concentrator that it almost makes me ask and this is what I ask myself I'm not telling you to ask yourself but ask your doctor okay 
but is it even worth it for this patient to carry this around, okay? Or is it more trouble than it's worth if they're not really getting saturated? Other things to keep in mind as we mention it on a concentrator, particularly for those of you using a pulse dose. Let me back up a second, okay? Different delivery systems. So what most people are gonna get this through a cannula, okay, a nasal cannula. And let me explain how this, that, how this works. So when we talk about a nasal cannula, if you're using a cannula, we are essentially talking about a low concentration delivery device, okay? And a nasal cannula essentially is only going to be effective up to six liters. So there are people who need 10 liters of oxygen. 10 liters of oxygen on a nasal cannula means that your cup is full at six and you are continuing to pour wine out and it's going out of the cup onto the table, which is a waste of good wine. And what I'm saying to you is that 10 liters on a nasal cannula is a waste of good oxygen. And you would actually be much better off switching over to a mask uh, with that has a reservoir where we, you know on 10 liters we can actually get you pretty close to a hundred percent oxygen and when you're getting 10 liters by nasal cannula remember that runny nose talk we had a few minutes ago guess what that's going to be extremely drying even with that little uh, humidifying bottle that you have trust me that's not enough to humidify it okay and that's going to increase your irritation of your airways drying it out, making you more uh, prone to bleeding, uh, making you potentially more inflamed, drying out your mucus, making you more prone to infection. So the question really started out as, can we talk about the different devices? The tank of gas is always gonna be the purest, okay? Uh, the oxygen portables are gonna be the least, you know, the, the, the least close to what the actual number says because remember, that's actually a setting, it's not a leader flow. So what are we supposed to do in this case, you're asking, right? The same thing that I tell you almost every week, rely on your instruments, okay? We have a talk every week about, I'm short of breath, but my oxygen is 96%. You, or we say, I'm not short of breath and my oxygen is 80%. You cannot always rely on how you feel to talk about your oxygen concentration. You can only rely on your instruments and oxygen saturation meter, or a blood gas, okay? So when you have these different devices, I would suggest, and again, talk this over with your doctor, but if you're on three setting and you're only at 88%, I personally, if that were me or if that were one of my patients, would turn it up to the highest setting. Use your oximeter to guide you, and the guide should be are you well saturated or not, meaning are you at 93% or above, and we talk about why I use 93 and not 90 or 88 as Medicare or some of the insurance companies do. And the reason is because most pulse oximeters have a plus or minus error rate of 3%. So if it says 88, I might be at 91, I might be at 85. Use your instruments, okay? And use that as your guide as to whether or not you need more oxygen. Dr. Braun made a great analogy. She said it's like a sweater. She said if the room is cool, you put on your sweater. If the temperature warms up, you take your sweater off. But don't go by how you feel necessarily because if you're 95% and short of breath, that additional oxygen is not going to help you, okay? Use your instruments. Other thing I want to say, on the pulse doses, the demand they're also called, which is where you trigger it, by taking a breath in through your nose, those work a lot like a scuba tank, okay? So if you are using a scuba tank and you go <laughs> you are going to exhaust your scuba tank and almost none of that air is gonna get deep into your lungs. So instead of the hour that you're supposed to have, you're going to wind up with seven minutes, okay? The other thing is that it's not gonna go where you need it to go. So when you are on a pulsed oximeter, or, uh, sorry, a pulsed concentrator, it's very important that you maximize each breath. So when you take that breath in and you hear it trigger, that doesn't mean it triggered down to your lungs. If it was giving you enough to go into your lungs, it would be like a bullet, you'd be on the floor, okay? But what you have to do is you have to take that breath along with a deep breath, and in the same way we talk about our inhalers, you have to carry that oxygen deep into your lungs and give your lungs the greatest chance of using it. So I hope that answers that question and several others. Next question. We have a couple of other questions that are also about oxygen. Okay. So one of them is, can you explain how is the oxygen affected by going through the CPAP machine? Okay, that's a good question. And um, I'm not 100% sure that I know the answer to it. So I'm gonna say, 
I'm not sure what you mean by affected, okay? When you are using a CPAP machine, okay, what CPAP means is continuous positive airway pressure. And it's almost, it, the most common prescription for CPAP is somebody with sleep apnea. And the thing about sleep apnea is sleep apnea is a condition where when people are sleeping, their airways close off and they actually stop breathing for periods of time that could be, you know, anywhere from a second or two to longer periods of time. And what the CPAP is supposed to do is the CPAP is going to give you a continuous positive airway pressure to prevent the airways from collapsing and closing so that even if you want to stop breathing, the CPAP keeps your airways open. The oxygen delivery on a CPAP, and again, these are the questions that I have. I'm not sure about this, but it's either going to be from a tank and 100% O2 or it's going to be less than that. I don't know the answer to that. I will check that with some of my friends who are respiratory therapists and get back to you on that. Can we do one last question on oxygen? Yes, one last question on oxygen. We could do many more questions okay. on oxygen because I like talking about oxygen. This one is asking about the pendant cannula oximizer. Okay, perfect. So the pendant cannula oximizer, okay? Essentially, it is what it sounds like. It's a pendant that comes with your cannula and there's a device it's kind of like a, a, a holding chamber for oxygen. And essentially what this does is this serves a similar purpose to that bag that you see at the end of the mask. And what it does is it essentially creates a reservoir. And what this reservoir does, okay, when you use a nasal cannula and it's just coming right out here, the 36% that we get from that nasal cannula is actually taking into account the fact that it's mixing with room air, okay? And what this oximizer does is it conserves oxygen or it oximizes oxygen by keeping it right here, increasing the actual percentage and concentration of oxygen that you're getting with each breath. First of all, it's preventing it from going out into the atmosphere and it's increasing the percentage of oxygen. So in theory, you should be able to use a lower uh, oxygen dose than you need than you would without using the oximizer or in theory you should be able to be higher saturated at the same dose of oxygen by using the oximizer next question okay new topic pulmonary hypertension do all copd patients have arterial pulmonary hypertension and other than do we or don't we have it, what else should we know about it and what can we do to manage it? Okay, so the question is pulmonary hypertension, okay? Do all COPD patients have it? And if they, what, what's the next part of it? What else should they know? What else should you know about it? Okay, so first of all, let me start with the first shameless plug of the evening. You know how I love to shameless plug. Um, on the 25th of this month, Dr. Evelyn Horn, one of the super geniuses of pulmonary hypertension and congestive heart failure and right-sided heart failure, there should be a, a color one, um, is going to be my guest on our Meet the Doctor series, okay? And for those of you that have seen the other ones with Dr. Kamahar and Dr. Braun and Dr. Kaner, you know that these people are smart, okay? Dr. Horn is a super genius of pulmonary hypertension. So on the 25th, and this is something that I recommend everybody tune into. So I will not, I was going to say I, I'm not going to steal her thunder, but that sounds silly as I say it because there's no way I could steal her thunder because she's a super genius and that's, that's what she does. But I'm going to talk a little about pulmonary hypertension. In order to understand pulmonary hypertension, let me teach it to you like this. And understand that what I'm about to show you is not drawn to scale, but I'm gonna show you a little bit of a graphic, okay? And this is a very complex computer-generated graphic of the heart. And hopefully you can see this. So let's talk about this from the perspective of the heart. I am actually, you can actually draw this on your own. You don't have to have as complex or detailed a picture as me, but essentially we're gonna think of it like this. The heart has four chambers. 
There are two upper chambers called the atria. So you have a right atrium and a left atrium, and you have two lower chambers, which are called the ventricles. So you have a right ventricle and a left ventricle. It is helpful to think of the heart as opposed to being a pump. It is helpful to think of the heart as two pumps. And for that reason, and the only time that people usually hear these terms is when they're getting an angiogram or a cardiac catheterization, but it's helpful to think of it as a left heart and a right heart. So let's talk first about the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart, or the left heart, is almost always the high pressure side of the heart. Now why is that? The reason for that is because the left ventricle is the chamber of the heart that pumps blood all over the body. And so as a result, it has to be bigger, it has to be thicker, it has to be stronger. Okay, it's like the six million dollar man, better, stronger, faster than the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart is normally the low pressure side of the heart. And the reason for that is because the right ventricle normally pumps blood to the lungs, which are only a couple of inches away. So that makes sense, right? So the left side has to pump all the way around the body, so it has to be big and thick and strong. The right side has to be is pumped to the lungs, so it is a low pressure side of the system. Now what pulmonary hypertension is, let me just talk a little bit about anatomy. So we have blood that flows from the lungs, okay, into the left atrium. When the blood comes back from the lungs, it, go, it is full of oxygen. It goes into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it flows through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. The left ventricle contracts and it goes through what we call the aortic valve through the aorta, which is the biggest artery of the body, and it gets pumped all around the body so that the body can use oxygen, okay? So let me say that one more time. Blood returns from the lungs. It's fully oxygenated because it's gonna deliver oxygen to the body. It goes into the left atrium. The left atrium contracts. It pushes blood through the mitral valve, which is in between the left atrium and the left ventricle. It goes to the left ventricle, the biggest chamber of the heart. It pumps. It goes through the aortic valve into the aorta, the biggest artery, and then it gets delivered to the rest of the body. High pressure, right? It goes to the body, all the muscles, all the organs, oxygen gets used up, and it then comes back as deoxygenated blood through the inferior and superior vena cava. You've probably heard those terms if you watch ER or MASH or Gray's Anatomy, okay? And this goes into the right atrium. The right atrium pumps through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, and the right ventricle pumps through the pulmonic or the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary arterial system and the lungs, okay? So I've already told you that the left side of the heart is normally the high pressure side of the heart and the right side of the heart is the low pressure side of the heart, except when you have pulmonary hypertension, the right side of the heart, and it could be the pulmonary arteries, it could be the pulmonary circulation in the lungs is high pressure. So what hypertension is to the body, when we say hypertension, we're talking about high blood pressure, we're talking about the systemic pressure in the body and the blood vessels, okay? We're now talking about the pressure in the pulmonary system, which is supposed to be much, much lower than the, right so uh, than the left side, and now that pressure is increased. And so that can transmit back, making the right side of the work, uh, the right side of the heart work harder, okay? And the right side of the heart is not designed for this. So the structures there are not designed to handle this much pressure, and that includes the, um, the, the, the chambers themselves or the valves or so on and so forth. This can lead to what we call right-sided heart failure, okay? When we talk about congestive heart failure, we're typically talking about left-sided heart failure. So when the left ventricle fails, blood backs up. Remember that whole kind of system I told you before? So when the left ventricle fails, Blood flows backwards and winds up in the pulmonary system, making you short of breath, which is why pulmonary, uh, why shortness of breath is one of the biggest um, symptoms of congestive heart failure. But when you have pulmonary hypertension, okay, there's an increased pressure that goes back to the right side of the heart and could lead to right-sided heart failure, and right-sided heart failure can then lead to left-sided heart failure. So there are what we call primary pulmonary hypertension and secondary pulmonary hypertension. And there is unknown causes where the pressure begins in the, in the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary circulation. And one of the biggest causes of secondary pulmonary hypertension is lung disease. 
COPD, uh, pulmonary fibrosis particularly, okay? So the reason why somebody may be saying, well, why should I watch Dr. Horn's webinar? The reason is that anyone with any type of chronic pulmonary disease is going to have an increased risk of pulmonary hypertension and congestive heart failure. So that is the, you know, uh, I hope what was a simple, even though it wasn't that simple explanation of what's a complex topic, and when Dr. Horn comes, we're gonna chop it up even more, and we're gonna try to, again, take a complex topic and make it understandable to the regular folk like us. All right, other questions? Um, on a related topic, this person has a question. Should I see a heart doctor and have tests done because I have had COPD for years? Okay, so should you see a heart doctor and should you have tests done because you have had COPD for years? And my answer will be yes in almost every situation. And the reason is because I will always err on the side of caution, okay? What is the downside to seeing cardiologists? None. There's no downside to it, okay? The only potential downside to it is financial, okay? But if it comes to spending money or having a heart attack, spend the money, okay? And you are right in, under, in, in stating that somebody with a long-term chronic pulmonary condition is at increased risk for heart disease, okay? Now, here's something to understand, okay? We often talk about the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary or respiratory system, okay? they're really not separate systems. They are really completely connected and they work totally together to make sure that your body is getting adequate oxygen and that your body is able to remove waste products. So at one time they really were treated as a cardiopulmonary system, then they really split into cardiovascular and pulmonary and absolutely the heart has its own issues. There are issues of you know atherosclerosis and coronary ischemia, meaning the heart is not getting enough blood, there's issues of heart failure, there's is electrical issues of arrhythmia, and we're going to talk about these with Howard Weintraub in a couple of months. Um, but, you know, the heart and the lungs are very, very closely related, and another reason why somebody with chronic lung disease should really have a cardiology workup is because, as I've told you before, but I'm going to tell you something else interesting that I haven't told you before after I tell you what I've told you before. Here's what I've told you before. Between the neck and the waist, there are many organs, there are many systems. Most significantly, the, the heart and the cardiovascular system, the lungs and the GI system, uh, I'm sorry, the lungs and the respiratory system, and also the GI or gastrointestinal system, okay? Many of the symptoms that we experience between our neck and our stomach can be related to the heart. They can be related to the lungs. They can be related to the GI system. And it's really important in terms of keeping you healthy and keeping you safe that we know which is which. So let me give you an example. Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath could very easily be a respiratory issue. That's a no-brainer. Shortness of breath can also be a cardiac issue. Let's talk about chest pain. Chest pain can be a cardiac issue, okay? It's most often thought of as a heart issue, angina, right? But many people with lung disease experience short uh, chest pain. Many people with GI disease, okay? GERD, gastroesophageal re reflux disease, acid reflux, ulcers. When that acid kicks up, it doesn't stay in the stomach. It kicks up into our esophagus, and our esophagus is best friends with our trachea, the biggest airway, right? So we are feeling something in here and very often, I got news for you, they happen at the same time. So they may happen during exercise. Why? Because during exercise is when you need increased cardiovascular demand. So that's when angina may came, come up, or angina, if you, say, if you want to say it that way. But that could also be a time when, because of the increased intrathoracic pressure and the increased abdominal pressure, that acid is going to kick up more. Okay? So when in doubt, I always assume it's the heart, I treat it like it's the heart, and I wait for it, the heart to be ruled out. So again, no downside to seeing a cardiologist. Now here's the thing I haven't told you before, or maybe I have told you before, but I, it's very rare that I tell you this. There are many people with lung disease that also have heart disease, okay? And if you think about it, when we talk about shortness of breath, I always tell you that shortness of breath will typically come on with high levels of activity. Stair climbing, walking uphill, walking fast, right? 
The problem is that when people start to experience shortness of breath, they find ways to avoid the activities that cause them discomfort. And now I don't take the stairs anymore. So all the muscles of my body, including my heart, that I use to take the stairs get weaker. They don't use oxygen as well. And as a result, I get shorter breath at lower levels of activity. So now I can map out my town by the inclines, right? And I avoid all the streets with inclines. And now all the muscles I use to walk up an incline get weaker. They don't use oxygen, you know, they, they decondition, they don't use oxygen as well. And now I get shorter breath on flat surfaces and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. That is what we call the dyspnea cycle or the shortness of breath cycle. Now here is something fascinating. It really is, to me at least. And this is why we monitor our patients so closely. When we first opened the Pulmonary Wellness and Rehabilitation Center in 1998, everyone said, why do you need EKGs? You have pulmonary patients, okay? To me, we need EKGs, okay? And here's where it gets tricky. And here's why we've been able to pick up a lot of things that don't get picked up in a regular workup, okay? I talked about walking quickly, walking uphill, walking upstairs, right? Let's think of it in those terms. When you have heart disease, okay, you have a very similar pattern often with how your disease symptoms progress. So let's talk about angina or chest pain. Let's say when your disease first begins, you only get chest pain walking upstairs, right? But now let's talk about this. So let's talk about over the years, because of your lung disease, you become less and less active, and we stop right here, but over the years, your heart disease is getting worse and worse, and here's the bisecting line. If you are so inactive because of your lung disease, you may never get up to the workload that it takes to show the screaming symptom of your heart disease. Think about that, okay? You may never be active enough to get that angina. Does that mean that you don't have heart disease? No. Does that mean that you're not at risk for a heart attack? No. Okay? So that is my reason for saying absolutely anyone with a chronic lung disease should also have a cardiologist in the picture. And if you ask your doctor, do I need to see a cardiologist? And they say, no, I would really want to know why. And I would say, what's the downside of seeing a cardiologist? Say, I'm a nervous wreck, okay? I'm a nervous wreck, okay? I, I just came from a cardiologist. I'm 44 years old. I had a stress test. Why? Because I don't want to think. I don't want that heart attack sneaking up on me. I want to know, okay? So there's no downside to seeing a cardiologist. When I see patients, there are three doctors that I want to communicate with when I see them. I want to communicate with their internist, I want to communicate with their pulmonary doc, and I want to communicate with their, with their cardiologist. So when I see a patient for the first time, I send reports to all three of those doctors because if something goes wrong with one of my patients during the course of rehab, um, it's almost always going to be in one of those areas. So it's almost always going to be related to the lungs, the heart, or something general. And I don't want to get on the phone and say, hey, guess what? Your patient's having a little issue. And they say, who are you? I want everybody in the loop from day one. And so cardiology, yes. Pulmonology, yes. Internal medicine, yes. Next question. Okay, well, now we have a question that's related to that because it's a question about a very rapid pulse. Uh, 145 in a very short period of time. They say there's no heart disease, but this rapid pulse has resulted in a huge weight loss along with shortness of breath. Can anything be done to reduce this rapid pulse rate? Okay, so the question is, I have a very rapid heart rate, 145 in a short period of time. Now, when you say in a short period of time, what I am assuming that to mean, and you know what assume means, but uh, I'm going to make an assumption because I have no choice unless you want to call in or type in, you know, and clarify this question. But what I really think you mean is that I am doing nothing, my pulse is okay, and once I start walking, my pulse rate shoots up, okay? So my pulse goes to 145 very quickly in a short period of time. Um, I have no heart disease. The rapid pulse has resulted in a huge weight loss and along with the shortness of breath. Can anything be done to reduce the rate? There's a few issues I want to touch on here, okay? So let's talk about this. To know whether or not 140, now 145 sounds on the high side, okay? But what would make this a lot better information and what would allow me to give you a lot better information would be if I knew your age, right? Because we talk about the maximum heart rate and we know that max heart rate is very age dependent, okay? And so where if you 
Google max heart rate, most of the time you're going to see a number that says 220 minus your age is your theoretical max heart rate, okay? At the Pulmonary Wellness and Rehabilitation Center, www.pulmonarywellness.com, we um, use a different heart rate. We generally allow people to go to 200 minus your age as a maximum. That's not what we're shooting for, but that's our maximum. And the reason why we use 200 instead of 220 is because we want to build in that 20 beat safety zone there, okay? So now let's talk about 145. So now if you're a 35 year old person and your theoretical max heart rate, if we use 220, would be 185. And if, even if we use 200 minus your age, it's still 165, then 145 doesn't sound that high. But if you're 80, okay, you're 76 years old, I was almost getting to you. So if you're 70, thank you for, for, for sending that in, Audrey. Um, so if you're 76 year old, that means that if you were here doing rehab with me, I would only let you go to 124, 125. I mean, you can't control 124, 125. But I would say 125 would be about where I want you to stop and maybe with a buffer to 130 as long as I didn't see any other signs of coronary ischemia. That's the first point to make, okay? Now, you say there's no heart disease, okay? Again, uh, and I think I asked you, I think I asked you if you have a, um, I think I sent you an email asking if you actually have a pulmonary condition. So if you can tell me if you do have a pulmonary diagnosis, that would be helpful also, okay? But now here's the thing, okay? When, when people generally talk about heart disease, they're really talking about CAD, coronary artery disease. Another name for it is coronary atherosclerosis, okay? So we're talking about plaque in the arteries, okay? When I think of heart disease, I don't just think of that, okay? I think of it from that perspective, which is a circulatory perspective, meaning coronary ischemia means that your heart is not getting enough oxygen, okay? But we also have to think of it from a mechanical perspective, and I risk stratify for congestive heart failure, which means that the heart is not able to meet the demand, the pump is not able to meet the demand, and then the other thing we need to look at is arrhythmia, so the electrical system of the heart. So those are the three things that I worry about when I see a patient, and those are the things I wanna make sure that we're not missing, okay? Back to this question, even though all this stuff is related, okay? So there's a lot of things that can make it go to 145, okay? Let me talk about some of them. If you are completely sedentary, okay, your body gets good at doing what you ask it to do. So if you are used to sitting on the couch, eating potato chips, flipping the remote, then naturally every time you get up, your body doesn't really know what's going on because it's used to sitting and doing nothing. So when you go from inactivity to all of a sudden being very active, and I know you mentioned with very little activity, but your heart can't see out of your body. So your heart doesn't know the difference between, let's say, running on a treadmill and getting chased by a bear. So if all of a sudden you're sitting and doing nothing and then you start running on the treadmill, your heart's gonna be like, what's going on here? Quick, we better pump, 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 because maybe there's a bear chasing us, right? It's gonna prepare for that, okay? That's where a warm-up comes in, okay? And I don't necessarily mean a specific stretching warm-up, but warming the body up gradually, starting slow. Don't go right from zero to 100, okay? So when you say no heart disease, okay, that again points back to my last thing and say, how do you know you have no heart disease, okay? Have you had an angiogram or a cardiac catheterization, okay? Maybe yes, maybe no, that's the gold standard, okay? But again, if you have severe lung disease, even if you have a stress test, okay, we may, may not be able to tell that you have heart disease. And here's the problem with one of, the, one of the big problems with a lot of the stress tests is that they start so hard and so fast. So the stress test that is most typically used for diagnosing heart disease is called the Bruce Protocol. And that starts at 1.7 miles per hour with a 10% incline, which is probably too fast for most 76 year olds with lung disease, right? So the test stops. Why does the test stop? Because you're short of breath or because your legs hurt or because you almost got flung off, off the treadmill, okay? And the problem with that is maybe the test was stopped and maybe if you could have actually walked further and longer, heart disease might have been diagnosed. So you have to be really careful with a pulmonary patient about how you try to diagnose heart disease. And that's where pharmacologic tests come in, where it's not dependent on you actually doing any activity, where a medication is given to, um, to actually simulate exercise, okay? 
Another point to make about this, you said the rapid pulse has resulted in a huge weight loss. No, it hasn't, okay? A rapid pulse is not going to be enough, okay? The heart is this muscle. It's big and it's strong, but compared to the rest of the muscle in your body, just having a fast heart rate is not going to cause weight loss, okay? But what's causing the fast heart rate is probably in the same zone as what's causing the weight loss, okay? And we're talking about metabolism now, right? So you said along with the shortness of breath. So I'm not sure, this is a grammatical issue, so I'm not sure if you're saying the rapid pulse has resulted in a shortness of breath because we know that a rapid pulse can make you feel very short of breath. There are certain arrhythmias, things like SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, uh, atrial fibrillation, that when those kick in and your heart is beating very fast, <laughs> That can also come with shortness of breath. Now the shortness of breath can make you, can actually make you lose weight because for people with severe COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, any type of respiratory disease where you are working super hard just to breathe even when you're doing nothing, you are hypermetabolic, meaning that your metabolism is so high that you're burning nine calories to one that you're supposed to be um, and that number is gonna vary a little person to person, but again, I would look at this as the big picture, and I wouldn't say what came first, the chicken or the egg. What I would say is, I'm losing weight, I'm short of breath, I have a hard, high heart rate, what is happening metabolically? And again, who do you talk to about this? Internal medicine, okay? Some internists are gonna be better at this than others. All internists should be able to, to figure this out, okay? But may need consultation from cardiologists, uh, pulmonologists, and in this case, okay, I would look at endocrine also, so possibly an endocrinology consult as well. Next question. Can we do one more I think, um, really similar question? Yes. I think it's quick. Um, Tonight I'm ending on time. Okay, okay, so this person says... 13 minutes. What if I'm 57 years old, I have end-stage COPD, I'm not on O2, and I have no pulmonary issues, then what should my maximum heart rate be while exercising? Okay. You're 57 years old and you have end-stage COPD but you have no pulmonary issues. Hmm, that's like saying, I'm not gonna, all right, I'm not gonna say what that's like saying, but I don't know what you mean when you say you have no pulmonary issues. Maybe you meant to say you have no cardiac issues, okay? But here's the thing. First of all, I hate the term end-stage COPD, okay? I talk about this, uh, you know, all the time. I hate the term end-stage COPD and I heard a rumor about how that got its name and it had something to do, no cardiac issues. Okay, good, that's what I thought. So here's the deal, you have end-stage COPD, no cardiac issues, okay? End-stage COPD, I'm assuming you mean stage four according to the gold COPD standards, okay? Um, what is a max heart rate when exercising? Again, I don't know you. It would be inappropriate for me to say what I think your max heart rate should be and here's why. Remember we talk about this or it's, I know it's in my book, so I can't tell anymore what is what I write and what is what I say, okay? But here's the thing. There's a theoretical maximum heart rate, and that theoretical maximum heart rate is based on age, so that's the 220 minus your age. Now, if I were to give you a stress test, we would get an actual maximum heart rate, and that maximum heart rate would be the highest heart rate that we see on the stress test, okay? And that, then we have what we call an actual actual. And what I mean by that is that the max heart rate that I see on the test, if the test was too vigorous for you to actually have what we call a hemodynamic response, meaning that it's actually a cardiovascular factor that caused us to stop the test, and it was either shortness of breath or lower extremity fatigue, then we're getting a max heart rate on the test, but that's probably not really your true maximum heart rate. So a lot of times people will send me a uh, stress test report and it'll say the patient exercised for a minute and 37 seconds and I know right off the bat that that's not an accurate stress test report because that can't possibly be long enough to actually give us the true cardiovascular data that we need. But I will go back to say this, what we do here at the Pulmonary Wellness Center during exercise is we do 200 minus your age. And so at 57 years old, we're basically talking about 140 to 145 as a maximum. That's not what you're shooting for. Again, it's not a target heart rate like you would see 
in a cardiac rehab program, that's about the max. But again, you can go to your doctor and say, I saw this guy online and he said this, what do you think of that? And he may say, no, you can go much higher, which again, I like safety, I'm funny that way. Um, or he may say, no, I want you to go lower, okay? But just understand that, you know, this isn't something that we dabble in. I mean, we've done nearly 70,000 visits with patients just like you, and we have a tremendously wonderful safety record, thank God, and, um, and we get great results with our patients. So I'm pretty sure about these things that I say. I don't talk too much about things that I'm not sure about. Next question. Do we have time for a couple more? Two more questions, yep. Okay, because I really want to ask this one. Um, Roz asks, why can I walk three quarters of a mile on the treadmill on O2 and not outside for just three to four blocks? Okay, so this is something that we have talked about numerous times and you know, I, I don't really wanna, I don't wanna try people, uh, I know there's a lot of new people here, so please go back and, and, and review the 50 hours worth of webinars we have online um, but I will talk about this because it's really interesting. So what is the difference between the treadmill and the uh, walking outside? And I'm going to make it brief because this was discussed in the last Q&A session, which the Q&As, the, the last two Q&As will be up on our website by tomorrow, www.pulmonarywellness.com. But in a nutshell, and I'm going to say it very quickly, when you're on the treadmill, you're using oxygen, the oxygen helps, okay? I already talked about the fact that the oxygen inside is more effective than the portable concentrator, which is not as good. When you hold on to the treadmill, you're fixing your upper extremities. When you fix your upper extremities, that's closed chain activity. When your upper extremities are free, that's open chain activity. Open chain activity puts your body and your diaphragm and your respiratory muscles at a poor mechanical advantage for breathing. When you close the chain by holding on to the treadmill, you actually are assisting the respiratory muscles in elevating the rib cage, giving the diaphragm big, big mechanical advantage. If you were to take a rolling walker and go outside, or a shopping cart, or uh, when you go to the grocery store, lean forward on the cart, you would have a very, very similar experience, okay? So the other thing is that the treadmill helps the legs come back. So there are three reasons. It doesn't mean don't do the treadmill. You have to do the treadmill if you wanna walk better outside. But again, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Tomorrow, go to the previous two Q&A sessions and this is explained in huge detail and much more slowly than I just explained it. Next. Okay, now, could you please tell us um, what is a nodule or what does it mean if we're told that we have a nodule in our lungs? All right, so I'm going to give a little shout out to my group, COPD, in parentheses, Breezy, Breathe Easy, one of my favorite Facebook groups, um, led by our fearless leader, Lisa Grace, and I want to just talk about lung nodules a little bit, okay? Again, this is not something that I am an expert on, okay? I'm not in any way, shape, or form in, involved in any type of diagnostic process. We do see patients both pre and post lung surgery for lung cancer. So those are gonna be the lobectomy patients, the uh, pneumonectomy patients, um, but I'm gonna speak very, very brief general terms and I am planning to have somebody who I have to keep nameless for now who is a lung cancer specialist on later this year, okay? And we're gonna chop that up in greater detail. But essentially, let's talk about a nodule, okay? One thing that is so fascinating about lung nodules is that so frequently they are found by not even looking for them, okay? So they're found on a routine chest x-ray. The patient's not having any symptoms. They're not showing any other signs. They're not coughing up blood. They're not doing anything. Maybe they're going because they have a rib fracture, okay? Or maybe they're going because they wanna visualize something in the abdomen, okay? But they're getting a routine chest x-ray and lo and behold, something shows up and we hear the term nodule, we hear a spot on the lung. These things generally are interchangeable, okay? When we talk about uh, an x-ray, an x-ray gives you some information but not all information, okay? But in general, um, when we talk about a pulmonary nodule, we're talking about a small, it's usually either round or oval shaped, thing in the lung, so you'll hear something that's called a spot in the lung, um, usually smaller than three centimeters, okay? If it's larger than three, now here's another thing to, to keep in mind, it's a little aside, but I wanna point this out. Medicine has gotten so 
advanced, that things are picked up at a nearly microscopic level that if this were the 1940s, you might never ever be treated for lung disease because you would never know, okay? But there are things now that pick things up very, very quickly. So essentially, when we talk about a nodule, we're talking about a mat, you know, something that's smaller than three centimeters. If something is seen that's larger than three centimeters, it's generally referred to as a mass, okay? A mass is almost more likely, is, is most usually gonna be more likely to be cancer than just a nodule, okay? But essentially what people worry about is cancer. So the doctor says, I see a spot on your lung. They may see a patchy area on your lung. They may say, I see a nodule. Um, and of course the big C word pops into our head because we naturally think the worst, okay? Understand that not every mass or not every nodule, not every spot, not every patchy area on a lung turns out to be cancer. In fact, most don't. And so that's why it's really important not to panic right off the bat, okay? You need to have good doctors that you trust that can walk you step, through, step by step through this diagnostic process. But basically, the two delineations are either gonna be malignant or benign. Benign meaning non-cancerous, malignant meaning cancerous, okay? But that being said, there are a lot of things besides uh, cancer, okay, that can cause these patchy areas on your lung. It could be mucoid impaction. It could be inflammation. It could be, uh, you know, that one of your bronchus has turned in a, in a different direction and is creating a shadow, okay? But again, there's no reason to throw out the baby with the bathwater or to jump to conclusions based on a chest x-ray. There is a diagnostic process that goes further, that includes CAT scans, that includes potentially lung biopsies where the tissue is actually sampled. Um, but in general, to answer the question, that's what we mean by a nodule um, or a spot on the lung. Again, this is not an area that I talk about day in, day out. So I, I don't, well, I recognize that that's probably not the cleanest, clearest explanation in the book. Um, I'm not really the person to give you that explanation, but I will have wah, 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 wah on the show later this year to really chop this up in great detail. And again, it's very natural that people with COPD or emphysema or chronic bronchitis or pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease or any type of respiratory condition want to know about lung cancer because very often a lot of the same exposures you know that cause these various respiratory diseases also cause lung cancer so again when in doubt um, you know err on the side of caution so it's 728 do we have any other couple of questions we could go to sure yes if we can I think that would be great um, one person is just asking what happens during an acute exacerbation? Okay. What happens during an acute exacerbation? So let's define some terms, okay? No, it's not cute, okay? Uh, there's nothing cute about an exacerbation, um, but basically when we talk about an exacerbation, what we're talking about is a sudden worsening of your symptoms. And, you know, depending upon who you talk to, they may define it in different ways, but that's the basic definition is that you're stable with COPD or emphysema or whatever it is, or IPF, it could be any of the diseases, okay? Please understand that when I'm talking to you guys in the forefront of my mind, I'm always talking about, I'm always thinking of COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, cystic fibrosis, lung cancer, because these are alpha one, um, because these are all the people that I see day in, day out. So I'm looking at this as one big, happy slash unhappy family. Um, but basically when you have an acute exacerbation, and again, it's gonna be different for everybody. You may be more short of breath. You may have increased secretions. You may have increased mucus production. You may have decreased activity tolerance, okay? Sometimes it could be an infection. Sometimes it could be increased inflammation. Sometimes there's no clear cut answer, but it's often associated with a decrease in lung function. And again, an exacerbation for one person may be different than, an, you know, it, it's, they're very, very variable based person to person, but essentially what we're talking about is an increase in your symptoms, a decline in your function, both, you know, your overall activity as well as your lung function. Next question, one more question. We'll do three more little questions. Let's go. Okay, uh, uh, let's see, how about this one? You talked about shortness of breath and its different causes. Um, this person says, I have scleroderma, I have both fibrosis and 
pulmonary hypertension, that's pH, yes? Right. How can you determine if your shortness of breath is caused by the fibrosis or by the pulmonary hypertension? Good question. So I have scleroderma. So scleroderma is an autoimmune disease, okay? It's a tough disease, okay? So I give you credit for the strong fight. Um, but I also have pulmonary fibrosis, right? I have fibrosis and I also have pulmonary hypertension. So this is very common with scleroderma. How do you know if your shortness of breath is coming from your pulmonary fibrosis or from your pulmonary hypertension? So the short answer is we don't really know necessarily, except here's the thing. If you have uh, both and your pulmonary, tent, your pulmonary pressures are brought under control to where they're normal and you're still short of breath, we can assume it's the fibrosis, okay? But let me talk about this overall concept for a little bit because we have a lot of patients who do have pulmonary fibrosis and also pulmonary hypertension associated with scleroderma, okay? Pulmonary fibrosis is a restrictive lung disease, meaning you have difficulty breathing air in due to scar tissue and due to hardening, okay? The, remember I talked before about secondary pulmonary hypertension, and in this case, it sounds like, and again, I don't know you, so I may be wrong on this, but it sounds like secondary pulmonary hypertension as a result of the pulmonary fibrosis, as a result of scleroderma, okay? And my answer is it almost doesn't matter what your shortness of breath is coming from. And the reason why I say that is because if you came to me, I would be doing all the same things that we would hopefully, that would hopefully allow us to reduce pressures, okay, along with your, your medication, um, but also um, to improve your lung function. And that always is going to include, um, you know, exercise, maybe starting off gradually, but ultimately working up to vigorous exercise. And that's a great question. And we're gonna talk next uh, later this month with Dr. Horn, and we will definitely talk about scleroderma and its relationship to pulmonary hypertension. Two more questions. Maybe just one even. Um, can you please say what was that paper that you were referring to earlier regarding the different O2 concentrators? Okay, so uh, I, I hope pulmonary paper, okay? Let's talk sponsorship. All right, here's the thing, just kidding, but we will. Um, all right, so this is the pulmonary paper, okay? So this paper uh, has been around. I don't, I don't know the history of the paper, but let's talk about it. Um, it it's, it's a paper, and again, I don't, I'm no hater, so I don't, I don't mind plugging someone else that I think is good, okay? Um, and I think this paper is good. They always come up with really smart uh, articles, and they're articles about people that, um, you know, they're articles that people with lung disease really need to know about, and I would say that every person that they have on their staff is somebody super smart that I respect. And one of the people, let's see who we're talking about, one of the people is Mark Mangus. Mark Mangus is, as I've told you before, respiratory therapist uh, laureate, okay, who I consider one of the top, if not the top respiratory therapist anywhere. Mark is, I'm importing Mark for three days from Texas in June to work with us here at the pulmonary center and Mark and I are going to chop up a lot of issues related to this and that we're definitely going to talk about oxygen concentrators then as well as um, you know the proper order to take your medications that's going to be that one we're charging extra for so we're going to double the rate that time instead of free we're doubling the rate but this is the pulmonary paper again I'm no hater I think it's a great paper I'm going to give you some coordinates of the pulmonary paper their phone number is 800-950-3698, www.pulmonarywellness. Oops, I almost threw in a shameless plug for myself, but this one is not shameless. It's for the pulmonary paper, www.pulmonarypaper.org. Um, and this issue is from May, June, 2013. Uh, there has to be one for 2014 which is probably in my drawer. I don't know why I picked this one. But anyway, you'll get the idea from this. And I know they also have an online uh, version of that chart. So what I would suggest is, is Google 2014 portable oxygen concentrators and the pulmonary paper, and that should come to that. And I will give some credit here to this guy who wrote this article, and his name is Ryan Deesom. And I saw something about you, Ryan Deesom, something related to the fact that you're going on this pulmonary cruise. So if you can figure out a way to get me on that pulmonary cruise, I like the ocean too. 
All right, we're gonna end there tonight. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in. I hope this was helpful to you. Next week, I'm taking the week off, and I will see you the following week on the 25th, where we will have a superstar of medicine, a giant of medicine. Um, understand that, you know, when I pull people in here, I mean, these are not just my buddies, because I don't, you know, these are the brains of medicine. Evelyn Horn, I'm also gonna have 31-year-old Chloe Temchin, singer-songwriter, one of my patients and one of the truest success stories in pulmonary hypertension that I've ever seen, and I will see you then. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good evening.